Can't keep a good man down. You can't keep a good man down. You can't keep a good man down. I went to the chairman and said, I would like to be given a brief to change the bank. Matthewson quietly began to recruit a new young executive team around him. I had never worked in a bank. I hadn't worked in finance. My background was maths and economics. George phoned me and he suggested I come and work in the Royal. I wasn't a banker. I was minding my own business in San Francisco. The phone rang. Uh, George Matthewson was on the phone and saying he was moving to the Royal Bank and would I like to join him? George decided that it was necessary to look at a major reconstruction of the entire Royal Bank group. Costs had to be got down. The stock market was dumping the shares. There was a real crisis. Something had to be done. Matthewson got rid of many of the old RBS executives and tasked his new team with an ambitious plan to modernise the bank called Project Columbus. We re-engineered all the payment systems, we re-engineered the credit systems, we re-engineered the sales process. We were the first bank to introduce telephone banking, for example. You could phone up on Christmas Day and make a payment if you were so inclined. We were one of the first banks to talk about putting branches in supermarkets. It was a groundbreaking project, and it worked. Matthewson's Project Columbus transformed the Royal Bank of Scotland, and by 1997, he'd tripled profits to over £800 million a year. The changes allowed OBS to survive, because had the changes made in the early 1990s not been made, OBS would have been gobbled up and become part of one of the other big national banks. But we moved to a view in which the bank really saw you as a source of cash. How much can we get from this person? Can we sell them a mortgage? Can we sell them life insurance? Can we sell them unit trust? It did make me wonder whether we had begun to create some sort of monster over which we had very little control. On the morning of the 7th of October 2008, as the RBS share price collapsed, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Alistair Darling, was attending a meeting in Luxembourg. It was a meeting of the European finance ministers, the meet monthly. He didn't want to go. He knew that he should be in the Treasury to handle the impending crisis. However, if he hadn't turned up, he was frightened that it would spook the markets even more. It's after he starts the meeting that events really get going in London in terms of the RBS share price collapsing. It's down about 30% at one point. It's been suspended twice. Christine Lagarde, the French finance minister, was asking, what's going on? I said that you know, at some stage I was going to leave because I was going to have to go and sort this out. While Darling was in the meeting, his team received a call from London. The chairman of RBS wanted to talk to Alistair directly, which is always a bad sign uh, when a bank chairman, you know, urgently wants to speak to the Chancellor of the Exchequer. Sir Tom McKillop had been chairman of RBS for less than two years. He'd come from the pharmaceutical industry, and this was his first experience of a banking crisis. He was clearly very, very anxious and very agitated. And he said, look, we're hemorrhaging money. There's billions going out of the door. What are you going to do about it? And I said, well, how long can you last? And there was a pause, and I thought I heard him talk to somebody, and he said, well, we're going to run out of money this afternoon. Alistair said he did feel scared at that point. Of course it's scary. With that scale of catastrophe at your doorstep, the largest bank in the world about to collapse, it took me, you know, a nanosecond to think, we can't allow this to happen. And so I went back to London to make sure that it didn't. Back in 1998, George Matthewson had become chief executive of RBS and re-established it as Scotland's biggest and most successful bank. But at 58 years old, he was looking to appoint a successor. OK, we're running. Try not to look at the camera. You would... OK. Thanks. He had his eye on Fred Goodwin, the 39-year-old chief executive of the smaller Clydesdale Bank. Fred was decisive, very intelligent, quite confident for a young man. He was much younger than the other chief executives. Goodwin had originally trained as an accountant, 
and was marked out by his systematic approach to cost cutting. Fred was known as Fred the Shred, and he got that nickname during his period with the Clydesdale Bank. He was quite ruthless in the way that he got rid of his people. There was nothing nice about it. As Fred said himself, my name doesn't rhyme with charming and considerate. <laughs> so you have to look at these things with a, a degree of scepticism. Goodwin's reorganisation of the Clydesdale persuaded George Matthewson to offer him the posts of both finance director and deputy chief executive at the Royal Bank of Scotland. The day of his appointment, I did get a call from the Clydesdale Bank. They told me they'd been partying for three days and good luck. They'd just had enough of the man and his rather rough and abrasive management style. With Fred Goodwin on board, he and Matthewson were soon confronted with a problem. In early 1999, their chief rival, the plain old Bank of Scotland, made an audacious bid for the much larger English bank, Nat West. RBS really had a sense that if they didn't participate in that deal, then their rival, Bank of Scotland, would become much larger than them, and they would then be the small fry and they would be swallowed up by someone else. So it was quite a sort of, it was, it was a pivotal moment for RBS. Matthewson and his new deputy decided that RBS, despite being less than half the size of Nat West, would launch their own hostile takeover bid. There's a huge amount of traditional city scepticism and snobbery about, as they see it, a couple of relatively small 